three five. Uh, within one eighty days, the subscription money has to be deposited, and subsequently, INC twenty A uh, form has to be filed. So every prom promoter say you have a a lakh rupee paid up share capital, fifty thousand, fifty thousand has to be deposited by each of the uh, promoter if it is a fifty fifty percent uh, company within one eighty days. If if you do not uh, put this money in within one eighty days, then the ministry has the power to strike off your entity. So it is very important uh, to to make sure that this amount is deposited within one eighty days and make sure this the amount is deposited in a in a check or a cash to your bank account because the ministry will check whether uh, there is documentation of the process that the amount is deposited in the company's bank account. So just depositing cash in your cash book won't help. You have to have a proper record, your bank record, to be very specific in this regard. This was not uh, being done uh, by most companies, and the ministry is going very hard for companies who are uh, failing to do this. So it is very important for you to do it. The next comes issuance of uh, uh, share certificate. Uh, the share certificate again has to be issued within two months from the date of incorporation. So it shouldn't uh, be that you keep on saying this is my company and of course the share certificates will be uh, will be mine. This cannot happen. Uh, this is one of the key due diligence questions that are asked whether the share certificates are issued within two months. And if you delay, it, then you have to go for compounding and things similar to it, and you have to pay penalty. And always remember during issuance of share certificates. Pay the specific stamp duty of your state. Just because just a piece of paper won't work, the share certificate has to be done properly done in that matter. Get the share certificate vetted by a company secretary or a lawyer or anybody, and do it properly. Uh, two directors have to sign over there, and it has to be stamped, uh, and then it has to be under <coughs> after. The stamp duty is being paid. The stamp duty uh, chalan has also has to be maintained by the company. So you must not forget to issue the share certificate within two months from the date of incorporation. Next come the annual base compliances. The annual compliances are very very uh, common uh, mistakes that people make. They do not file their annual compliances. They say that uh, they don't have. Um, uh, the liberty to do it for certain reasons whatsoever, and this was very common case till 2017. Uh, from 2017 or around 2018, this onwards, the ministry strike started strike off. Um, I mean, putting companies who have not filed those returns uh, to the strike off mode. They cancelled the certificates of all those companies who have not done the uh, annual filings for the last two or three years. And they also penalize the directors and barring them to uh, to become director of any other company for the next five years. So we we are aware of various entrepreneurs who, for certain reason, make this made this mistake, and they face the prosecution and penalties, and they cannot become the director of the next five years. So this has to be done very very minutely. There are two forms that has to be filed. One is AOC four, the next is MJT seven. The AOC four is simply uh, the financials, the audited financials of the company. This has to be done within thirty days from the end of the uh, uh, end of the AGM. Usually, the AGM, the last date of usually the AGM is thirtieth uh, September, because uh, the law says within six months from the end of financial year you have to hold the AGM. We will go detailed in the next coming slides. But uh, within 30th September, usually all the companies have to hold their AGM, and from the end of that 30 days, uh, we have to file AOC four. For MJT seven, which is more or less a return of the shareholders, members, the basic uh, the basic uh, structure of your entity, this has to be done within 60 days. Um, and if you do not do any of the Uh, two things. Not only you are you have a chance to become penalized uh, uh, at a future uh, point of time, but right away you get a penalty of hundred rupees per day. 
Yeah, am I audible? Hello. Yeah. So right. Uh, so uh, coming to the next thing, uh, we have to do DHI KYC. Now, what is DHI KYC? DHI KYC is a type of <laughs> KYC form uh, that has to be uh, filed uh, by every director within. 30 days from the end of financial year. And this has to be done every year. So make no mistake of uh, saying ki when, when we do it last year, we do not have to do this year. This is not the case. It should be firmly done every year. And, uh, and, and companies have to make sure that they do not make a mistake of, um, of not filing it because the penalty amount is as high as 5,000 rupees of form, right? And once you do not file your KYC, then the director cannot become the director of any other company, okay? Next comes Deputy 3. Deputy 3 is nothing but the return of any deposit or any loan or any sort of a thing. So if you have taken a loan from any person or have taken a deposit or have you have got any sort of a donation from the government, from uh, grants or anything, you have to file this form. If you do not file this form again, there are penalties applicable to it. So your company secretary, corporate governance manager should make sure that all these four forms, which is annual on, in nature, has to be filed every year, right? So right. Okay. Uh, next come the secretary compliances. The every company, uh, regardless of the structure, has to uh, have at least four board meetings. And I'm just concentrating on private limited companies over here. So every private limited company has to have a four board meeting. Um, and between the two uh, meetings, um, there has to be a gap of not more than uh, 120 days. So you must make sure of that. Of course, there are certain relaxations for IFSC companies and small companies, but uh, in major cases, four board meetings are mandatory. Again, uh, next will come annual general meeting. Every company has to have uh, AGM, as I was saying last time. Uh, you have to hold the AGM within six months. <coughs> <coughs> within six months from the end of financial year. And uh, you have to file the, uh, the necessary forms accordingly. And, uh, and you must make sure from the next, from the previous board meeting, previous AGM, the date uh, of the current AGM shouldn't be more than 15 months. So there shouldn't be a gap of more than 15 months between the two AGMs. So that is a cause of concern. Uh, frequently, people mistakes it, mistake it. So say, for example, somebody holds a AGM in May, and uh, they think the next year they can do it on September 30th. That is not the case. So if you do it on, say, 2nd May, uh, then you have to do it by, say, uh, around 2nd August, you have to file your AGM. So hold your AGM. It cannot go uh, beyond that. So uh, you have to make sure of that. Next comes statutory registers. These are hardly maintained by any companies. And this is the reason many due diligence officers uh, raise questions. And, and frankly, this is one of the biggest diluters uh, for any company. Uh, every company has to maintain your statutory register as per SS1 and SS2 of uh, the ICSI guidelines. So if it, as for register of members, register of shares, register of charges, ESOP, register of debentures, everything has to be maintained and it has to be kept in the registered office of the company. It cannot be that uh, you put it in your corporate office and keep it as it is. It has to be maintained in the registered office of the company. Alternatively, you can have a, 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 a virtual 
folder where you can keep it, but you must maintain in that virtual folder properly all this uh, uh, details, right? Uh, coming to the next point about event-based compliances. Now, these are the compliances that has to that's, that is uh, uh, that takes place as and when uh, the company uh, sees the event. So, say for example, in case of change of director. Uh, your co-promoter may think of quitting as a director, he might join another company, things is, or you might have a difference of opinion where you guys decide to quit. So you cannot leave it as it is just a resignation letter won't work. You have to file DIR 12 form. And similarly, during the time of incorporation, uh, during the time of appointment of director as well, you have to file DIR 12 to the ROC. Uh, the second comes appointment of statutory auditor. Uh, the statutory auditor has to be appointed uh, in the AGM, uh, in the first AGM itself. And this will be happening for six years period. And it should be, uh, it should be made sure that this appointment for, uh, for a period of five years can or should happen. It cannot be for a one year period in the first AGM itself. Okay, and uh, subsequently ADT one has to be filed to the uh, Next come the alteration of the object cross. Say for example, you guys decide to change the object cross of your business, right? So uh, you want to do some other business. Uh, so for that, you just simply cannot change it. You cannot just start doing it. You have to take the permission of the ministry, pass the necessary resolutions, and then go for change of your object, right? Uh, next will come change of the name of the company. You guys decide to change the name. Uh, the, so the name doesn't work and the investors say you have to do something else. So uh, then you have to file INC24 and then uh, proceed accordingly. Uh, share trans, uh, in case of change of name, you, we must understand that there must, must be a brand name and uh, a company name might be different, right? So for uh, Tax Mantra, we our company name is TM Solutions Private Limited, but our brand name is Tax Mantra. So you can change your brand. You just have to, if you want, you can file a trademark, right? But if you want to change the company name, then uh, you have to file all the necessary regulatory uh, norms that the government have uh, announced, right? So share transfer also. Just a written, uh, a written paper saying that I transfer my shares uh, to so and so person doesn't work around. Many a times we have seen that promoters uh, in, in a sort of disagreement say that we do not want to continue on this and they just share on some transfer document and get out of it. So basically it won't work. You have to file a CH4 and only then uh, after this, uh, paying the necessary SAM duties uh, your, your your share transfer will take place. Uh, the next come change of registered office. So if you want to change your registered office from one city to the, I mean, one place to the same place, say for example, in Calcutta from MT Road to Salt Lake, right? Then you have to file INC 22 uh, and that would be it. But if you want to change, say from Calcutta to Bangalore, then it's a whole lot of process, which includes putting advertisements, uh, which includes uh, passing journal meeting uh, resolution over there, um, filing forms, then appearing to the regional director of the ministry and uh, requesting him to uh, give us the permission, taking permission from the creditors. There's a whole lot of process and it should be properly executed one by one so that uh, you get the best chance of getting it approved, right? Uh, so after that, uh, we concentrate on this are the compliance this perspective. Uh, I also thought of uh, putting in uh, an agreement which I will come a bit later. Uh, one thing that one one needs to be sure that the previous things are all for companies, right? This is, uh, but if you have a limited liability partnership, what do you need to do? You need to file uh, form eight within 30th October and form 11 within 30th May. 30th May, uh, the form 11 says the uh, basic uh, partner details uh, that this partner with their solvent or insolvent stuff like that. And form eight is basically the financials of the company. 
uh, we must make sure that if you cross a turnover of 40 lakh or a contribution of 25 lakh, uh, then you have to get your books audited. Uh, I have seen people that they have crossed a turnover of 50 lakh, but because they were not aware how to cross, they couldn't get their books audited and then subsequently uh, face prosecutions because of this mistake. So we must make sure that this is done properly. Uh, filing form three is again a very, very important, uh, a very important thing that needs to be done. If if the the right from the date of incorporation, you have to make sure the form three is filed. The form three is filed within thirty days on the date of incorporation. It is basically the agreement, right? That uh, that the company has to be uh, executing it. So uh, and after after you change, say for example, you change the contribution process, if you change the partner, if you change the main object of the company, in all cases, form three has to be filed. You change the agreement and you file form three. And in all the cases, in all form eight, form 11, form three, it should be noted that if you delay this filing, this is a penalty of 100 rupees per day. Uh, I, have, I have clients uh, who have paid around two and a half to three lakh rupees just for not filing form three. So uh, uh, you must make sure that all these filings, form eight, form 11, form three, are done by your limited liability partnership. Uh, now, these are the basic structure for every uh, company and LLP that has to be done. Of course, there are various other integrities, but these are the basic compliance, basic corporate check that every company uh, or limited liability partnership should do. And once done, they are good to go. They are, uh, they are, they have the basic corporate governance structure in place. Uh, for uh, I, I wanted to prepare this slide specifically for startups. Uh, startups who uh, who are uh, doing um, uh, doing starting their business, right? So they must make sure these three agreements are properly in place. This is not again a mandatory, but very very important. This is not only helps you during due diligence, but more importantly, this is uh, a thing that will help you to resolve future disputes. And I'm telling you why. The promoters agreements are agreement that are uh, done uh, between the two founders. This thing, say for example, Mr. X and Mr. Y tries to do their business, right? And Mr. X is an expert in finance. Mr. Y is an expert in marketing. Both are coming to do uh, a business on say uh, an IT or IT IDS product, right? So uh, Mr. X uh, says okay, for any financial reason, for if anything uh, in regards to the finance, I am I am the person to go for. And Mr. Y says okay, for anything in regards to marketing, I am the person to go for. And it's certain if, if, if it happens for any reason, uh, a penalty is imposed by the government uh, of that particular business vertical. Say for example, a penalty is imposed because Mr. X did some mistakes in the past of finance, right? So your promoter's agreement might say that in case Mr. X does some mistake and uh, for which the company is penalized, Mr. X will uh, give those um, a penalty from his pocket. So these are very, very, uh, uh, very, very formal sort of agreement that has to be undertaken. And, uh, and people must make sure that they take this seriously because this will help you in dispute resolution. Say, for example, after, say, three years, Mr. X tries to, if a penalty order comes in and Mr. X tries to move out of the company, Mr. Y can say that because you have signed the promoter's agreement, you should be held responsible equally like mine and you should pay the penalty in this regard. So this has to be done in the cash promoter's agreement. Vendor agreement and service agreement is simply uh, is simply uh, a sort of a agreement that is executed between the company and the service providers. Say uh, I have a service providers in regards to uh, 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 a person who is supplying me with uh, uh, with uh, uh, my say computers, right? And if say the computers are not working properly and I have a proper agreement in place, then I can uh, ask for penalties and come and, 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 and ask him to pay up for that, right? 
this is the easy remedial measures and this is only the basic say for example i want to develop a website and i give um a, a, a it company to develop my website properly and they screw up if you have a proper uh, service agreement or vendor agreement then this will help you to get uh, the claim damages in this regard ip assignment ip intellectual assignment is very very important especially in today's tech world if say your employee have developed an ip right uh, or say uh, uh, your associate has developed an ip it needs to be immediately transferred to you as in the company as in the startup right one must make sure that this agreement this the ip agreement is in place uh, so that the employee cannot claim that this ip belongs to him individually and not to the company uh, during your employee, uh, employee agreement uh, the ip has to be this ip assignment agreement has to be there in your clause or a separate agreement for that matter can be executed and uh, then uh, people will uh, be uh, very sure about the fact that any ip that has been developed uh, in the course of employment will belong to the company and this this will help in the long run so i think uh, that's about it uh, from my side um if you have any specific query just let us know we are a global tax and legal firm we help startups emerging companies to in their business in maintaining this compliances this corporate governance mechanism and we also helping due diligence so we exactly know which are the compliances that has to be undertaken so that uh, there are no issues hi uh, swamit thank you uh, so uh, it's it's a great uh, webinar and uh, we have learnt lot of interesting things and it is very important for businesses to understand the the requirement of compliances and the corporate law and uh, uh, we will come back soon with more webinars uh, till that time thanks everyone thanks for joining in thanks omik again yeah thanks thanks guys bye